welcome to another session of Neighbors and Friends. I have with me here today Karen Covey and Mary Bennett, who will help me talk about the first woman mayor of Iowa City, Iowa. Emma J. Harvat was uh, born to a couple that had immigrated here from Czechoslovakia. And they lived in what is today called Goose Town. Emma was born in 1870 and lived until 1949, which brought her to the age 79. Her dear friend, May Stack, was born a little later <clears throat> in 1877 and lived until 1972 at the age of 95. So May lived a number of years after uh, her partner had died. Emma Harvat was uh, child number nine in a family of 10. And from an early age of six, she was going door to door selling garden vegetables. So she had, a, 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 from the running start, she was a businesswoman. Emma attended St. Mary's parochial grade school, went to City High, went to Williams Business College, worked in a bookstore, and saved enough money to buy the bookstore. You all know the bookstore down there just across from the Pentecost. The town of, or the city of Iowa City, was a very small city surrounded by town, uh, by farmhouses and farms. All the way uh, up uh, east toward what we know as Summit Street, it was covered with farms. What we know as Goose Town had a lot of farmhouses and small farms, and the streets were all muddy. One thing Emma is known for when she was elected mayor was getting the streets paved. But Iowa City started out as a small town. The territorial capital, still a small town. I think there was actually a dairy down below uh, uh, the, uh, what we call the Pentecrest, or the old capitol building down on the level ground toward the river. So uh, people grew their own supplies, raised their own surprise, uh, supplies. The, uh, now Emma, as I said, bought and sold a bookstore took her money and went to Kirksville, Missouri, bought, improved, and sold a number of stores, and at the age of 43, decided she would come home to Iowa City and retire. I was absolutely amazed when I read that. <laughs> when she got back to Iowa City, uh, she discovered that her uh, childhood friend, May Stack, had inherited some money because her father had just died. Uh, he too had he had been, in, I think, in the shoe business, and um, Emma's father had been uh, a butcher, I believe. But anyway, the two women then decided to pool their money, and instead of retiring, they bought uh, a women's clothing store. Made a, a number. Ready-made clothing store. Pardon? A ready-made clothing store. Ready-made. Which was just coming on board in this country. And they made a number of trips to New York to buy the fashion. And uh, I understand that uh, May did the selection of the fabric or the clothing, and uh, Emma 
did the business work. So after being successful with the women's store, they decided to sell that. Uh, was it because of uh, other people starting to have women's stores? Or? I don't know. Do I think it coincided with her serving public office because they closed that store in June of 1922, which just is on the heels of her becoming the mayor. I see. So I assume she just didn't have the time to devote to the business. But they did enter into some other activities, which were developing houses yes. and building properties around town. Right. So I think they shifted gears away from the clothing and uh, decided to enter into <coughs> some new entrepreneurial activities. Mm -hmm. One of the, the, the pieces of a ready-made clothing store for women was that, at least for those women with means, with economic means, instead of having to take time to select and do their own tailoring, they could go and buy ready-made clothes. And so with that free time in their lives was a allowed, again, women with means to have more time to volunteer in the community mm -hmm. and to be more politically active in the community. So in a lot of ways, ready-made clothing stores was another part of the women's movement. I see. And the Harvard and Stack store that they established was for women's apparel exclusively. And prior to that time, you might have just gone to a dry goods store and bought a bolt of cloth, cloth but you mm -hmm. had to find someone to sew the garment for you. Right. So they were really in a period of innovation, and that's what made their business possible. I see. And I think they first rented a, uh, a place in uh, the Jefferson Hotel or the Jefferson Building, and then they rented or bought, I'm not sure, uh, on number 10 on uh, Dubuque Street, mm -hmm. South Dubuque, I believe. I don't know the details That's of correct. this. That's and so correct. it was, as I said, a, a town very much centered close to the old capital. Mm -hmm. But I think the point that Karen was making was that she herself then became part of the commercial elite in Iowa City. So she was ru rubbing elbows with more affluent people who had this disposable income. Mm -hmm. And that might have opened doors for her later when she was a political leader to have interacted with different economic statuses within the community. All right. <coughs> and she, uh, I was looking all over town uh, for uh, someone who would remember her. You'd have to be pretty old to do that. Mm -hmm. Actually, had I been born in Iowa City, I'm old enough to uh, have remembered her. But um, I have a neighbor in Ecumenical Towers. Marguerite is 105, mm -hmm. but she did not move to Iowa City until 1930. So she missed the mayor part. And uh, she said, oh yes, we lived a block south of them. I knew them. I saw them having lots of fancy parties. They did like to socialize. Um, May's, May's nephew, Carl Stack, was someone who um, was with us when the city council dedicated the council chambers to the Emma J. Harvat Hall. And that's one of his big memories, too, is the socializing uh -huh. that Emma and May hosted. Right. And as you were mentioning, they knew the business people, they knew the bankers, they knew the university uh, faculty and president, and uh, they entertained a number of theatrical people because May was interested in theater, and they entertained a number of uh, famous theatrical and musical people. And uh, those are in the articles. I urge people to look them up on Google and go over to the Iowa Historical Museum uh, or Center where Mary works and go over to the archives at the University Library. It's a wealth of material to read. Well, what that evidence tells us, really, or suggests, is that she was a very colorful character. She must have had a wonderful sense of humor. I believe she was very direct and forthright when dealing with people. So her personality kind of emerges out of these documents. So even though we don't know her in person, we can sort of fabricate in our imaginations what she might have been like. They were a striking couple. I understand they were both over six foot tall. They were rather large, and they liked to dress in the stylish clothes of the season <laughs> and of the, uh, you know, the most popular styles of the day, bringing those fashions from Paris or Chicago or New York 
here to Iowa City for people to enjoy. So the part about Emma J. Harvitt that is so impressive is besides her business acumen, um, she was elected in 1921 to the city council. And when the current mayor, Ingalls Swisher, resigned, the not the community, but the, the council decided amongst themselves who would be mayor. And so she was chosen to be a leader amongst the leaders by her, co her male cohorts. Right. And making her the first female mayor of Iowa City, but also the first woman mayor in any community in the United States over a population of 10,000. Mm -hmm. So this was an important moment and an important place. And people from all over the country came to interview her. Uh, people were, uh, a French journal came and interviewed her. Uh, the first uh, English paper in Shanghai interviewed <laughs> her. So it wasn't just regionally that this was noticed. It was all over the world that this benchmark was noticed, mm -hmm. and it happened here in Iowa City. <laughs> and I'm going to refer to a few words that Professor Linda Kerber wrote, which is that in the political context of the 1920s, her role is really significant. Because when she served as mayor, there were no women in the Iowa legislature, no women judges. Women had just achieved the right to vote, but there were very few women to vote for. Mm -hmm. So she really is uh, an important figure for giving women a voice in what goes on in their government. Mm. And actually, uh, the Republican Party of her time had asked her to run for, for the assembly. And uh, um, back when it was a grand old party. <laughs> I, uh, and in fact, it took till 1929 before the first woman was elected to the state legislature. Really? And so Emma Harvitt's activities were really focused on her community, her hometown. And when she served, she served as mayor and as a judge of, of the court. And she had a, a drunkard one time brought in and charged him $10 and, and uh, expenses. Oh, he said, I'm not really drunk. She said $20. <laughs> she was tough on public intoxication. And the other pieces that she brought to local government besides paving roads was really making sure that the business of local government was run efficiently. Yeah. And to this day, from that time, the city of Iowa City continues to win financial awards for having their financial house in order. And it started with Emma J. Harvard. Right. Yeah, she really wanted to clean up city government, and she believed in meticulous public records. And so she even published the city's quarterly financial reports in the newspaper. <laughs> she thought that was information that should be shared widely. That way you don't have any hint of corruption or wrongdoing going on within your city government. Mm -hmm. She also decided that it wasn't appropriate for men and women to be housed together in the, in the jail. Mm -hmm. And so that was separated by gender and uh, that was important for the health and well-being of women who were being incarcerated even locally and started the first juvenile home, wanting to make sure that, that minors who were in trouble were receiving s different kinds of services and not mixed with adult populations. So those kinds of social programs spearheaded by a strong personality made them successful. Right. I think she, uh, it started in what we call the mansion down there on Gilbert. Right. Uh, the closed mansion did become the boys and girls home at, I think, around 1930. And I but she set everything in motion a little bit earlier than that. I, am I right in uh, remembering she bought that herself? I don't know that that's correct. Oh, oh. I think the city bought it for a very inexpensive price. But to follow up on her own attitudes, the one thing that we can see here uh, is that she said, quote, running a city is like running any business. A woman can do it just as well as a man. She continued to say, I'm not a politician. I've never even taken the slightest interest in politics, not even women's suffrage, until four years ago. So she was really entering into a new life when she took on this role, but she did believe that her experience and training in business really won the election for her. And you're mentioning women's suffrage. I believe she was elected, what, just a year after women had the vote? Mm -hmm. And when I went to uh, the archives at the university library, they handed me what they had, and among the material they had was a stack of material that thick of Karen working on getting the council chambers 
<laughs> name for Emma. But yes, just tell we, us about. Well, we had a, a nice committee working on that. Mary was part of that committee. Regina Bailey was part of that committee. And we had support from the Johnson County Historical Society, from uh, the city of Iowa City eventually. And what we were really doing, this whole conversation started because we were putting together a program to celebrate the 80th anniversary of women's right to vote of the 19th Amendment. And we felt like we wanted to do something big and important and long lasting and not just an event that people came, it happened and people walked away. And council chambers just wasn't exciting enough. <laughs> and so in, in looking at activities for the 80th celebration of the 19th Amendment, we, we started talking about Emma J. Harvat and decided that we thought it would be a good project to work with the city to rename the city of Iowa City Council Chambers to Emma J. Harvat Hall. And it was very specific that the J was in there. That was important to her. And I, I will note to the city that there is another, um, another honor for um, Emma J. Harvat in the Peninsula neighborhood where there's a park. Although the sign says Emma Harvat on it and not Emma J. And I would love to take some carving tools, but would never deface Preble property in that way um, to have that corrected. But we actually thought that it would be a fairly easy thing to do. And we thought it might be a six-week project. It ended up being a six-month project, which for anything in, in local government probably is pretty fast. So maybe we were unrealistic. But we were happy to have a proclamation from the then Mayor Ernie Lehman with the full support of council uh, to change the council chambers to Emma J. Harvat Hall. Mm -hmm. And there's a portrait of Emma J. Harvat in City Hall. It's the largest mayor mayoral portrait there, and it's painted by a local artist. And then there are some pictures of Emma J. Harvat and Maystack as well outside of City Hall that are available for people to look at 24-7. Uh, mm -hmm. So we really felt like that endeavor rescued her from obscurity because mm -hmm. most people in our generation really had never heard of her. Mm -hmm. So the other thing we did to make a greater impact was that same group of people got together and nominated her to the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. One year they allow, each year they allow one historical figure rather than a living person to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. So we were able to take all this evidence and letters of support and there's a silver loving cup that was given in honor of Emma J. Harvitt. And if you go to the city council chambers, you'll see that in a plexiglass box right as you come inside the door. So in some way, those council chambers have become her home. Mm -hmm. And everybody coming there, young and old, is gonna ask questions about who was this woman? And they're gonna find out it's a very interesting answer to hear. <laughs> Is, what, was, what was the J for Emma J? Harvey? We don't know. <laughs> I don't think we know. It's a Someone mystery. could try and look up a birth certificate on her or something, but I frankly don't know the answer to that. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. But it was important to her, and so we made it important to us to make sure oh, that, that right, was included. Right. I uh, have called um, various churches in town to try to find out if they have a record of it. Uh -huh. uh, if I find that, if I do get hear back from them, I'll let you please, know. <laughs> please let me know. So we worked on this um, and in 2000, and in t it must have been that year that Mary and I first put in an application to the Women's Hall of Fame, and it wasn't accepted the first or the second time, I think. It was on the, the third time was the charm. And we were very pleased um, that they selected her. It, it was important that she be in the Women's Hall of Fame. And it was a delight to be able to go and accept the award for the city. Uh, myself and Mary was there, and uh, Regina Bailey helped accept the award, who was the mayor at the time. I see. And this uh, is in Des Moines? It was in Des Moines. Yes. But that really put her on the map statewide and really nationally so people can celebrate her accomplishments. Because oh, yes. she's really n nationally significant, oh, being yes. that mayor of a, lar a city larger than 10,000. So and our next step, if we really had a lot of giddy up, would be to create some kind of small high school curriculum for history classes about Emma J. Harbaugh <laughs> to make sure that when people are talking about the history of the country, the history of Iowa, the history of women in government, that Emma J. Harvitt is part of that his history lesson. Oh yes, such an important part and such a, uh, an important, uh, successful mayor, such a, 
uh, with good government records, mm -hmm. putting them public, published, and uh, getting the city paved, other efforts to uh, the keeping the men and women separated mm -hmm. in incarceration, keeping the children uh, separated, building a home for them, uh, orphaned or, or homeless children. She really serves as a source of inspiration because of her achievements, and I think that's really why we wanted to celebrate her life, was to remind people that you can make a difference in your community. It doesn't really matter what your background is. If you're serious and do your homework, you can become an expert in that area. <laughs> and so we really want people to realize the possibilities, especially in our lifetimes, because people like Emma Harvard were really pioneers who had to make their own path in this world. They didn't have any role models to look to in terms of public service like that. Right. So she becomes our role model, and we're grateful to have her in our community. Right, and, and, and she came from uh, the time when, as I said at the beginning, there were mud-filled streets all over town, a, a small town. And very narrow definitions for women and what they could do with their lives. And so right. she challenged those conventional notions and had a can-do spirit that really allowed her to demonstrate her abilities. You know, sometimes people will ask if you could meet with a historic figure, who would you want to meet with? <laughs> and one of my, I have many people I'd like to meet with, but one of them is Emma J. Harvitt. I would love to talk local <laughs> government with her um, and also talk with her about being a woman of her time because looking at her quite realistically, she was um, a developer and a builder and landlord at a time when there, there were some... Um, discrimination built into um, covenants on property about where people of color could live in the community and to talk to her about how she felt about that if she tried to fight that if she mm -hmm. even noticed it when she bought a property that had the covenant on it and because um, we have to realize too that even though we might have if she were her same self today we might have a negative critique of her that she was a woman who lived in the times that she lived in mm -hmm. and I would love to be able to talk to her about those kinds of issues mm -hmm. and I think you might have questions about her relationship with May they're referred to as lifelong companions right. they were definitely business partners but there's obviously much more to that the codependency between them is demonstrated throughout the historical evidence Absolutely. and it would be really interesting to ask them about their attitudes towards each other or how others perceive them in the community whether they faced any discrimination because they were two life partners that were women living together mm -hmm. oh and if we had that information we might be able to say that Emma J. Harvatt was the first lesbian elected in this country <laughs> <laughs> right. I have no doubt, but I mean, obviously they were accepted by the community. They entertained, as I said earlier, as you said, all the business people and bankers. They entertained university people. Obviously, I think it was just silence they, about that part of their lives that we can't really confirm from a historic record explicitly. Right. And right. because of their involvement successfully in business, I think that their living arrangement was quietly accepted. Quietly accepted. And in conversations I had with May's nephew, Carl Stack, there were certainly many suggestions and hints about the very deep love they had for, and deep respect they had for one another. Absolutely. The kind of bond that we might look at it like a marital bond. But we don't really have the evidence to know how far their relationship went, other than we know it was very successful and they helped each other through life. Because of, and because of the time that they lived in, they uh, people called them best friends and they left it at that mm -hmm. right but what was wonderful about them as a partnership no matter how intimate it was or wasn't um, they complemented each other very well and they spurred each other on and it was a strong partnership mm -hmm. and it was good for the community well they came from about the same period of hi history as uh, Catherine B. Bates and we started our series uh, neighbors and friends in October of 2008 with a special little interview from heaven with Catherine Lee Bates, <laughs> who, uh, whose partner died in 1915. And uh, Catherine Lee Bates herself lived on another 15 years. But they again were a couple 
two professors at Wellesley College. They were called by faculty and staff, uh, Catherine B. and Catherine C. Catherine C. Was, uh, Catherine Lee Bates was the English professor and a poet. And uh, Catherine Coleman was a history and economics professor. Uh, was a founding member of the American Economic Society. And um, they were so accepted by the community, as Emma and May were, mm -hmm. that when children would run home, Mama, Mama, I found a bird with a broken leg, Mama would say, take it over to the Catherines, they'll bandage it. So talk about acceptance, you know. No mother would send her kid over to the Catherines unless they were accepted. And, and they lived together all, all their professional life. So one of the sad things in some ways about the Emma J. Harvat story is that she really thought that over time we would have equal representation between men and women. Yes, yes. We have only had a majority of women on the Iowa City City Council once for a short period of time when Amy Corio was elected. And what year was that? 1999, she was elected and served one term. And so for two years, we had a majority. We still in Iowa have not elected a, a governor or a congressional member who is a woman. And so Emma's, Emma J. Harvat's vision of that there will be that equality has not been lived out, but we shall strive to keep working towards that. Mm -hmm. It's necessary for the health and well-being of our communities to do that. Right, and I uh, read somewhere about uh, getting the, uh, the vote. Someone said we weren't given the vote. We, uh, I shouldn't try to quote something. I they don't. earned it. They had to work <laughs> for it. It was a privilege that they had to work for. Yeah. But uh, th according to the Constitution, they were members of, uh, we use mankind today, meaning men and women. But anyway, what? Although before the 19th Amendment, women could be elected to office. They could serve if they were, if they got majority vote, but they couldn't, but women couldn't vote. <laughs> so oftentimes they were like sc school superintendents or some other elected office. Yes. That was in a role that we traditionally put women into, like teaching, for example. Mm -hmm. I think to end on what Car Karen said here, and this is an Emma J. Harvick quote, she predicted, quote, I believe eventually there will be as many women as men in public positions, and neither will dominate. So let's hope we achieve that someday. <laughs> let's hope so. Emma Harvard had uh, much to teach us and much for us to be proud of. Uh, and thanks for sh shining some light on her today. <laughs> well, Iowa City can be proud of being a woman, uh, a, a place where women were, were accepted and honored. We're proud to have Emma J. Harvat and her partner, May Stack, who are in St. Joseph Cemetery with uh, plots uh, very near to each other, as the director of the cemetery told me. <laughs>